So good morning, everyone. Um, I thank you for choosing to spend your time with us this morning as we talk about product development. I know that's a, a topic that we've had a lot of questions on and an area where we see businesses can a, a little bit too easily lose, um, lose funding. Um, so we're going to start with a, a brief explanation of who we are uh, putting on this, this meetup, um, go over our purpose today and our agenda, um, and then introduce our guests. So I will uh, periodically through this beginning point, just remind people to please mute your mics until you want to ask a question. Um, so uh, my name is Kim Mozingo and I am a program manager with DEFTEC, which is the Maryland Defense Technology Commercialization Center. Uh, we also have uh, with us today, uh, Gary Evans, who's the executive director of the program and Griffin St. Louis, who is another program manager. Hi, Griffin. Um, we're just going to, I'm just going to go over briefly what DEFTEC is. We are funded by the Federal Economic Development Administration to support businesses in Maryland in getting access to the facilities and researchers at the federal labs um, and also the intellectual property. Uh, so we work with the labs very closely. Uh, we work with businesses, uh, get to know who they are. Um, help them find opportunities to do product development with the labs um, and work with them in other capacities. Uh, so it, several weeks ago, we had a, a meetup on uh, the medical supply chain and some of the complications of taking a product or a test uh, that someone is developing through the medical supply chain. How do you get it approved? Um, what's the, the proper sequence of events and, and a few other challenges? And it, it makes sense for us now to talk about product development because there are so many opportunities to take a wrong turn or make a mistake. And working with a design and manufacturing firm can help you save money um, and not lose money uh, and not make a uh, horrendous mistake. So we thought it made sense to uh, speak with one of our partners to talk about how we can kind of ease, ease some of those issues. Um, and this would be a really great follow on. So this morning, the, the purpose of this is we're going to have Harbor Designs talk about um, what they do with their process and, and overview of a project that they've worked on somewhat recently. Um, we're also going to um, you know, have time for questions. So if you want to ask a question, there is a chat window up in the upper right hand corner. Uh, you can use that to just let us know you have a question. Um, if there's a you know an appropriate pause in the conversation, you can just go ahead and unmute your mic and and ask your question. If you'd rather not ask the question yourself and you want us to do that for you, we're more than happy either anonymously or using your name. Just let us know. Um, so we are today. We're going to talk about. Uh, we're going to have this discussion. We're going to talk about the product development cycle. We're going to talk about how you reduce risks throughout that cycle when you might want to connect with a product development firm. Uh, Harbor Designs will go over a, a project that they've worked on to give us a really good example. Uh, we're gonna talk to you about how they protect your IP, uh, which is something you should be concerned about and you want to be aware of. Uh, and then we're, we're gonna talk about packaging a little bit and, um, and Harbor Designs will give us an update on some of the things that are going on with manufacturing uh, right now is in this uh, COVID-19 environment that we're all living in. So we've, we've partnered with Harbor Designs before. We worked with them in February to put on an event that was just for our clients and uh, a couple of prospective clients. And the purpose of that was to talk about product development, but in an environment that gave our, our, our clients opportunities to network with uh, potential markets and network with each other and meet the kind of resources that um, can help them build their business. So let me take a minute to introduce everyone that's, that's on today from Harbor Designs. Um, we're gonna speak primarily with Margie Coda, who is the Vice President of um, Strategic Partnerships. I almost forgot that Margie and I didn't write it down, I'm sorry. Um, and Margie is gonna walk us through a good bit of this. Um, Kevin Barnes, who is a founder of Harbor Designs is also on, on the line with us today. And Kevin will jump in and talk about um, some of the stops in the, uh, uh, talk about the 
project overview that we're going to go to run through. Um, and we're hoping that Josh Barnes can, can join us as well. Um, he may or may not. So I want to first say thank you so much, Harbor Designs, for agreeing to be with us this morning. Um, I know from talking to you over the weeks and you are incredibly busy. Uh, you're responding to COVID-19, uh, doing lots of lots and lots of work and trying to do it at a distance. So we really do truly appreciate not just your partnership in general, but that you have uh, decided to give some time this morning to talk about this really important topic. Um, so with that, we're going to jump into um, the whole purpose of our conversation today. And I'd like to ask Margie to just give us some background on Harbor Designs and Manufacturing, who they are, um, what they do, and, and their product development cycle. Great, thank you, Kim, and appreciate um, Gary and Griffin and everybody for joining the call today. Um, Harbor Designs is really excited to be here, and I am thrilled to always talk about what we do because um, it's, a, it's a dream opportunity really to be on the forefront in talking and getting to know inventors, people who are solving solutions on a, on a national and global basis to make our lives easier every single day. And I think that really goes back to the reasons why Kevin and Josh started this company, really to become a virtual engineering team, an extension of your particular companies, providing the resources, the expertise that you need in order to really fully develop your product. Um, so it's exciting to be connected with all of you today and appreciate your time. Um, as I mentioned, Harbor Designs is just over eight years. We're not a very old company. We're very much like a lot of the folks on the call today. Um, but Kevin and Josh come with a unique background with over 40 some years and I'll shave a few years off Kevin for your background, um, <laughs> but really extensive experience in a variety of different um, uh, product developments for the automotive industry, the biomedical industry, you name it. And it's hard to say, but these guys have touched it, been there, done that. So it's really exciting that they're the brains and the backbone driving the engineering team to always produce something to a quality level as well as that really is innovative and meets or surpasses the needs of today. Um, so we're really excited um, to also have been joined by the ABLE Foundation, which has really been our crutch to get to where we are today. ABLE Foundation, for those of you who don't know, came to us um, a number of years ago, just I think three years ago, and asked us if we were ISO certified, can we make medical diagnostic products? Because they saw the Baltimore region in particular um, as an opportunity to provide those additional services and it was lacking in the arena. And Kevin and Josh in true fashion said, yes, we can do that. So they jumped in and in a short time, we met the ISO qualification. So we're now an ISO 13, uh, 485 and 9001 certified company making medical diagnostic devices as well as consumer products that need to have those uh, qualifications. And that's really one of the key identificators or ways to identify risk mitigation is go to a company that has quality processes and engineers in place so that you know that when you hand over your invention and your baby that it's in really good hands, that they're gonna develop it in a quality way. Um, but this really allowed us to provide a, a variety of service offerings, not just in the consumer array, but also to make sure that we met all of the FDA certifications. Um, we actually use a Greenlight Guru software service that actually allows our clients as well as Harbor to do all the proper documentation, which again is another risk mitigation opportunity for companies. So that should you have any recall, should you have any warranties in the future, should you need to change anything about your product or improve upon it, you've got the quality documentation of the software service in your hands. And, Harbor Designs is really proud to be able to provide that service um, to our customers. And it's um, not only a great opportunity, but it's also a great savings for our folks. So um, we can do everything from professional engineering services, quality management, we have a clean room on site. We also um, can do supply management, global logistics and warranty and repair. So we try to become that true extension of everybody's company. So you don't have to go out and replicate and buy all those services and have them on the team. Um, we come back and we do upgrades and retrofits for some of our companies. So it's a really exciting place to work, but it's really that first interaction that I get, that phone call, that email, when people say, hey, I got an idea. 
And then you get to delve into it a little bit further with the inventors, with those folks that might want to solve a problem that exists in our society today. And that brings us really to the, um, the process phases of how we actually go through and design products for our clients. And I'm gonna share my screen if that's okay with you, Kim. Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So as I Harbor Designs is a ISO certified company 13485 as well as 9001. And this is important because if you're planning on going after FDA certification, UL certification, or CE certification for your products on a global basis, you want to make sure that you're working with a company that provides the regulatory guidance um, in every step of the fashion of designing, developing, and creating your product on a mass manufacturing basis. So this is one of the things we're really quite proud of. Um, and we have a quality team actually on our staff um, with Raytheon trained um, VP of quality, as well as a manager who actually works directly with um, a lot of our clients, walking them through. And of course, we have a variety of relationships on the back end to make sure that if, um, if you have somebody else you want to hire, we have a number of consultants that we recommend for folks as well. So we also make sure that um, you've got the right people on your team to give you all the information you need, depending on whether you're going consumer or you're going the um, medical device route. Um, just to give you an idea, as I said, it's really exciting to work at Harbor. And if you can imagine um, being one of the first people really to hear about a product that's going to come to market and to be able to have a little bit of opportunity to impact it, make it better, um, change it, bring a little uh, different twist to it. We've worked with name brands such as WM Bar, um, doing Damprid, Amtrak, uh, a lot of the transportation logistics services. Um, because of where we're situated in Maryland, we have access to the federal labs, which is part of the reason why we work with DevTech, um, as well as some of the other labs in helping them do their uh, tech transfers. We work closely with the colleges and universities. One of the things I love the most, um, being able to work with inventors who have over 200 plus patents under their name, not only just at the University of Maryland, but at Johns Hopkins, who are constantly looking at new ways to improve our lives. Um, from Dr. Jim West, who actually was one of the key components of developing electromagnetic uh, chip that's in all of our cell phones, to Dr. Fischel, who is at the University of Maryland, who was one of the first pioneers of the pacemaker and has even worked on an electromagnetic um, pain management system. We've done work with FlavorX, which is a pharmaceutical drug um, reconstitution and flavoring machine company. They like to flavor children's medicines, and we help them bring a new way of flavoring children's medicines to the market. Um, we work with FiberCell, um, which is Kevin's background and experience, um, and I would let him talk about it because it's amazing. And what I love is in the space station, and it's in almost every lab in the United States around the world. Um, we've also worked very closely with Sonavi, one of our new um, uh, startups here in Maryland that is actually making an auto diagnostic stethoscope, which is now being used in a test um, bed for Nova Hospitals for the COVID-19 study, actually able to allow just about anybody to determine what's going on with lung sounds and whether it's abnormal or not. So we're really working on cutting edge innovative technologies in the industry and is so excited exciting to be at that avenue, at that crossroad, helping people bring their product to market. I know when we first started, Kim said, most of the products that people want to bring to market actually never make it to market. And there are a lot of things that um, Harbor Designs does in the sales process, which is the beginning of our development phase of your product. And so if you're okay with that, I'd like to just jump right into the process development. Um, unless there are any questions, Kim, you want to through or deal with? I don't think we have any questions right now. I think talking through the product development cycle and, and how you do all the magic that you do um, might be something that will, will get people thinking and uh, have some questions pop up after that. So thank you, Margie. Okay, great. 
So I'm going to jump into our process. Um, we have a four phase process at Harbor Designs and Manufacturing, and it really starts with our, that first phone call, that first email that we get when somebody reaches out and says, hey, can you help me with this? And they could be at any process in their lifeline of product development from, I just got this idea last night. Does it exist on the market? What do I do? How do I even get started? To we have gone through um, designing this. It maybe it's come out of a, a lab where they've already done all the research and development behind it, and they want to actually commercialize it for use outside, such as colleges and universities are often in that same boat. Um, but in the discovery process is really where we start with you as a client or you as a customer. Um, and even if you never become a customer, Harbor Designs has always used the premise to help people identify whether or not they have a really good idea and how to go down that pathway. Um, one of the things um, that we do is get an NDA in place with all of our clients. This way we're able to protect not only your IP, but the IP that we're working on within our um, facility because we will eventually bring you in and you can actually see what's going on in the shop floor and you might have a chance to actually see somebody else's great idea. So in that sales process, one of the things we do is we ask all kinds of questions. And this is where I kind of get to put on my, my hat and, and say, okay, where are you in your process? What is what does your invention look like? What problem does it solve? What, what are the cost savings? What are, what are the benefits of your particular product? And some people might think I'm just being nosy, but actually it has a lot to do with the ability to make sure that, that you've done your homework on this. Um, Harbor Designs and Manufacturing, as well as any professional engineering firm, will really want to work on products that are going to make a difference and that have the funding and the ability to be sold on the back end, because our whole goal is to make products. So understanding your particular needs on what you want and where you are in the sales cycle um, in developing your problem, does it solve a solution? Have you done a patent search? Have you really gone online? Is there another product like it out there? Um, I'm constantly amazed, but sometimes I take an idea to the engineering team and they're like, oh, and they do a quick search and they say, is this what you're talking about? It's like, oh, it already exists on the market and may not be something I'm very much aware of, but it could be something that that is already on the market. There are design patents and industrial patents that still could be made on this, but you, you wanna make sure that you're bringing us a product that you've truly vetted, that you've done the homework on, you have an idea of what it looks like, it fits within the brand of the company that you're developing, um, and you've identified your market, who would actually buy your product and at what price point you're looking at. So a lot of times we do get folks from the very, very beginning of the process from I got an idea to all the way to a fully vetted, I've got a prototype, this is what it does, this is what it solves. So we get people on all aspects of the, um, the, the discovery chain, so to speak. But once we've truly identified whether or not, you know, this is something that they want to bring to market, we've kind of talked about our process moving next into when you actually come and meet with Harbor, essentially what we'll do is we'll get the information from you again, because sometimes a couple weeks has gone by, you've gathered more information, you've determined um, what things look like. You actually can at, um, ask us questions on, on the timeline, the budget, things like that. We really wanna make sure that as we're designing your pro product, we're actually creating it to your specifications. If you have questions on how things work together, we're able to also answer those questions as well. So Harbor Designs has on their staff, engineers, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, design engineers, to actually bring your product to life based upon your product specifications. So we always have our clients sign off on a um, product uh, requirement document, which means that we've actually listened, we've heard everything that you've said, and this is the overall end game for your product at this stage of its life. We do understand that there are upgrades, bugs, changes, fixes, and you might wanna refine it as you go. But our whole goal is to make sure that you either get um, a marketing function, a marketing prototype, a functional prototype, or just um, some industrial designs, depending on even if you have to go get more additional funding for your product. Okay. So, um, so in the design process, our first goal is to get the product requirements down so that we really understand what you're looking for. Then what we do is our industrial designers go to work. And this is where the magic happens. This is all kind of 
part of art and science, but the art is actually designing your product to your specifications on paper, um, drawing it out so that we understand as it's coming to life, you're giving us continued input on how we can actually make it uh, exactly what you're looking for or improve upon what your idea is in your own mind. At this point in time, our folks are really good as well on the computer, so they actually generate computer-generated design models of your product and can actually place it in a picture so you can see it in everyday life. Even though you haven't been able to touch it, feel it, um, actually put it in your hands or see it on a table, it gives you a very good idea of whether or not we have captured exactly your specifications. And that's when we start, once we get that approval, moving on to the next phase of the process, which is actually into the engineering phase. And this is where we're actually able to take your product and design the physical attributes to actually bring it to life. So from all the CAD drawings, STP, the solid work files that we need to have for mechanical, electrical, software, um, all the quality processes that go into this is probably the longest part of the product development. Um, it takes the most time because it's got to be thought out clearly and uh, methodically in order to design your particular product for um, manufacturing. And this is one of the critical aspects because Harbor Designs actually can go out and produce your product for you. So we don't want to design it that in a way that is difficult or it's cumbersome or it takes more time to assemble it, we wanna make sure that we're assembling it, designing it in the easiest way possible. So once we're able to do um, the engineering, there are a couple other folks that need to come involved uh, or get involved in it, depending on if it's an FDA approved product. This is where our quality management team might play a role. Your quality FDA advisor might play a role with Harbor to make sure that we're actually designing and bringing in all of the fail stop um, uh, items that we need to meet all of the FDA and the regulatory guidelines that you need to present to the FDA. Um, again, our whole goal is to risk mitigate um, in the product design so that you can easily go back and fix anything, we can challenge anything, that we have it all documented so that if there is any other future issues, we can go back and make tweaks or changes very, very easily. So Margie, um, we had a couple of questions, but I just want to uh, let people know I'm, I'm responding to your questions because I need clarification. Um, so if you could uh, just uh, respond or, or let me know you'd actually like to speak, that would be helpful. Thank you. Um, so you have such a wide variety of experts that you bring in uh, that's likely surprising for people, um, especially someone who has just thought of a, a concept or is just at the beginning of working on um, a product. Mm -hmm. It sounds too like there, there are just opportunities, you know, from beginning to end for incredibly costly mistakes um, on a company's part, on the company's side. Um, right. Can you talk about some ways that they might uh, mitigate risks either in, in working with you or before they get to you? Um, just any, any kind of tips that you can share that, to help them understand maybe when to contact you, when to start working with a, a design firm? Can I jump sure. in? Absolutely, Kevin. Okay. I, I can tell you, you know, if you had the ideal company, if you were lucky enough to be financed in a certain way that you had a CFO on board, the CEO, an engineering department and a manufacturer, you would be talking together right at the beginning. You would make sure that each of you understood what was necessary and that you could get feedback so that the ever critical grants that are going out had the proper data and was properly presented. I like to recommend people, you know, again, we're trying to be your engineering and production team. Talk to us as soon as you can. It may not go a lot further, but if you come in and say, this is what we're trying to do, we can oftentimes give you a approach, the best way we suggest doing it. But if you're already going for a grant, a key critical thing we can do is give you kind of an overview, a best guess of what it's gonna cost to take it through the general development what type of testing is going to be need to be done, what type of quality, and ultimately what type of capitalization is going to be necessary to get it into production. If you have all that, 
your CFO's job is a little bit easier getting together his presentation of what you're going to do and how long it's going to take. So again, if you had these resources available, part of our concept was to make them available until you got to the point where the ROI made sense to hire your own. I mean, that's going to happen inevitably. We understand that. But until it does, use just what you need for as long as you need or as little as you need and get in and get out. And again, if there's somebody that has expertise that can give that expertise overview to you, you're not going to grab it all, but get you in the proper direction, it becomes part of your future presentation and understanding. So to answer the question, as soon as possible, you know, when you come up with an idea, come in and talk. You know, the first hour is free, you know, and we hand over a lot. After that, Anything that we come up with in our contract is yours. As long as we're under contract, if we come up with the unique, it's your IP. We hand it over, you give us a dollar and you pat us on the head. And hopefully that helps you make product and make more product because that's our end game. We want to make this stuff. We want to, we're in a hub zone in Baltimore and we want to bring people in that can walk to work and put things together with a torque screwdriver. And if they can do that, then they're hired. And we want to hire at least a couple hundred of those. So that's our goal. Does that make sense? It does. Thank you, Kevin. Um, I want to remind everyone, if you're if you're not talking, to mute your mic. For some reason today, we're having lots of feedback. Um, it, it doesn't happen all the time, but who knows? You know, we all have to be flexible. Um, so I appreciate that, Kevin. If I could just summarize, the best time to get to you is in the beginning. Uh, schedule a meeting. Schedule time to talk. Yeah, it might be a half a year before you come back again, and that's not unusual because grants take forever. But yes. get in there yes. quickly, get an approach, get a document you can follow. We do sign letters saying, yeah, we understand what the product is, and uh, this looks like a good idea and a good approach, and here's our endorsement. And that, that helps. Yes. Okay. And you can, know, uh, I can just jump real in quickly. In Today's environment, um, we are experiencing and seeing um, major logistics and supply chain um, issues due to the COVID virus. Um, there are a number of man-made and natural disasters which have actually impacted companies' abilities to survive um, in the past. So everything that you as a inventor, a CEO, a CEO can do to really mitigate against um, anything that disrupts your supply chain or your process. Any one person who has all of their knowledge in there is, is technically a liability, it's a risk. So you wanna make sure that you've got your processes documented, you have um, alternative resources and things. And that's one of the things that we look at doing to make sure, so we're not always up against something. And this has taught all of us a lesson um, to make sure that we've really looked at every aspect of our business, identified opportunities for pivot, and then really making sure down the line that when we've identified our customer, what would make that change? How would that make that change? Does the buying decision maker change? These kind of disasters um, have opened up a lot of different issues to risk. And I think we all need to look at a number of different things in our supply chain, as well as our business processes to make sure that we can actually mitigate and respond to those appropriately, as many people are doing um, over the last couple of months. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Um, so let's, I think this is a good a, a good segue into talking about Co-op Tech and the work that you've done with them. Um, do you wanna take that, Kevin, and Margie and I will mute our mics while you talk? Okay, that's fine, no problem. Thank you. Um, Coaptec was an interesting company. They were a spin out from the university and had a technology where they were going to allow doctors or even potentially a PA and such to put a feeding tube into someone, not necessarily in the GI lab, which usually took three people and a reasonable amount of time and expense, but potentially in the uh, patient's room itself because of the way they approached it. They had the luxury of already having a concept that worked. It was not refined. They worked with another engineering company to refine the concept a little bit. And then they brought it to us to take it more into the manufacturing and quality mode. So they already had something that kind of sort of worked. Uh, they had a prototype of it. It was pretty rough. 
but it got them um, a good running start. And they were also lucky in that they had some regulatory support that they brought in, and they had an engineer on board that had taken a product into a medical market in the past. Now, she wasn't an expert in this particular area, but she knew the pathway and the guidelines. So a lot of the stuff when it came in was done for us, which was nice. Um, again, we can jump in at any point. And in this particular case, they asked us, all right, first, we want you to refine the catheter system. You know, the one that was made for us as a prototype. It was melted with a soldering iron, but it worked. We refined it. We got them in contact with a company that would do production. Um, and we supported that. So we came up with the drawings and the necessary uh, specifications and such. And going back to the next, the bass, pass side, I'm sorry, one back, please. They then said, okay, what we have is that balloon device that you put down the patient's throat. And it uh, usually is something that you have to blindly grab in the stomach to attach a feeding tube and pull it back out. What they did and what was clever is they put a magnet in it so that when you put it down and it gets into the stomach, there's a magnet there, and then you need a beastie magnet on the outside that you can put on the body, and it goes click. Now you know where that tube is. And then you can take a scanner, and we'll go into that. But the next thing they asked us to do is, all right, we've got to come up with something that's going to be on the outside. It's going to be in a bag. It can't fall over. And they said, but, you know, here's the general procedure. So they started with the catheter being inserted, you know, the magnets in the belly and they have a magnet on the outside, which doesn't look like that. This thing weighs pounds. Um, you find it and then you take an ultrasonic gun. And we had to look at this as we were designing the shape of the device on the outside because you have to get the sonic gun right up to the surface so that wherever you poke through, there's no vessels that you're going to be puncturing. So again, we had to get all this information from them because to be fair, this is a brand new concept and a product. Nobody has all the specs yet but you have to start by looking at the risk of what could occur. And this is a standard risk. You have to look around where the catheter is gonna be inserted and you have to find out what vessels are there and make sure you stay away from them. So now you've got everything done and they start to come up with specs for this secondary device. The first one's already done, it's getting developed. The second one now is this magnet on the outside. And you had to sit down again and say, what exists out there? What patents do you want? We try to stay within the patents that were supplied. If we come up with something, we want to make sure that they expand upon that patent so it's easily applied to, and they can release them as they want to, if they want to extend the patent, whatever, but we will work with that. If we see something where we see there's an interference and potentially if they've given us other patent information they're trying to stay away from, we'll let them know they're drifting towards it. But anyhow, in this particular case, their major thing was this is going on a belly, all right? Big ones, small ones, concave, convex, it can't fall over while you're doing this operation. It has to have a way for the doctor to hold it from a lot of different angles. So it needs thumb grips, hand grips, whatever. You wouldn't think so, you know, just put a magnet out there and you'd be done. But again, you had to have a device that was encapsulated in a way that could be sterilized in a multiple different approaches from being immersed you know, for 24 hours to being steam you know, autoclaved. Um, and then all the different shape requirements, because in some cases, in most cases, this is in a bag. But the scariest thing of all is this is a magnet and this is not a small magnet. This is a magnet. If you get two of these things close together, they come together with force that is surprising. So as we were doing the design of the device and finding out the forces that were necessary, we had to come up with methodologies and testing on how to measure the magnetic strength you know, to make sure that they didn't vary from our vendor. So we had to find the vendor to make sure they could satisfy those specifications. And then we had to create a jig to do an audit to make sure when they came in, they were within spec. So we did all that. And then we had to work with a couple different ultrasound devices and find out the most common ones in the market so we could see what the interference was around the external surface and make sure that they could get the readings that were necessary for penetration. And then magnet orientation and such, the biggest one was, again, this usually stays in the uh, hospital arena. So we had to find a way of packaging it that would neutralize the magnet so that if something else got close, it wasn't close enough. So we had to come up with packaging that actually had things that would deaden the magnetic field. So all of that was part of the thinking as we went through this. Next slide, March. Now you get into how does you come up with these shapes. And what we did is we came up with lots of sketches. 
And they went out to a bunch of different physicians who said, I like this, don't like that. Here's what I like about this. Can you add these features? And we came up with a bunch of different CAD designs so that we could enhance how they reviewed them. But as you can see, this is just one page of about five pages of devices that we laid out concepts and looks for because the customer, again, this was a new area, didn't know. And the only way you can really get people thinking is to put something in their hands. And once they do that, they can put X's through things so fast. But if you don't do that, it takes a long time to get to a final product. So we do sketches first, then we go into CAD designs and then next Margie. We came up with a design that looked pretty good. Now this is actually bypassing one step. I think the next slide down shows a clay model. That done. Okay, a different presentation. Um, we actually made a clay model of it and we tried a couple different things, let the customer come in, it was on our table. They brought a couple of physicians with them. We put it in a bag, we let them play with it. And yeah, there we go. And we came up with a shape that everybody finally agreed to. Not perfectly, not everybody agreed to it, but at least the majority agreed to it. And that shape was then rendered back in a previous slide into the design of what the device would look like, different things they wanted to have on it, you know, some ergonomic grips, uh, the copolymer molded. And then even as we did this, it started to evolve further. And this is what the final device kind of looked like is sitting on the belly there. And then we found out some more specifications that every once in a while, they drop these off of the patient and they drop onto the floor and they bounce, hopefully. In some cases, you make them out of the wrong materials. They don't, they crack, they break open. And this magnet is not light. Um, so we actually had to come up with, you know, it's, it, it ended up being actually simple in a lot of ways because there's a polycarbonate blend out there that works for most medical products and satisfies sterilization techniques that are typically used. But we made that one on the left there with the blue gloves and put a mock-up magnet in it just to play around with the ergonomics and got into the ceiling of it. Now, this is still a low volume product. They're not making thousands of them a year. Our initial intent was that this was gonna be a sonic welded device, that they were gonna put the bottom half into a cavity, uh, put the magnet in with its uh, choke, put top cover on it, and then hit it with a sonic weld, which would seal the whole device. Now that costs, it costs a bit. I mean, when you're doing sonic welding, you have to make cavities and you have to have the right energy and do the sequence analysis to make sure it's all sealed correctly. So these first ones, it was decided they would be um, UV light welded. So because of that, the first ones are clear and that allows the light to go through. And even in the deep sections of this mold, it penetrates and it seals. Um, also, this has a lot of ribs in it. And most of those are there, not because it's required structurally during use, but when it falls, it is. So we had to look at that and make sure that if it fell up to three times, that it would satisfy and still be, you know, a good sealed product that would work effectively. There are some tricks to it. I mean, because when magnets hit something hard, they actually lose some of their magnetism. And that is part of what we learned by working with the other engineers at the magnetic company. So we do that very, very early. We get involved with other experts because we're not experts in everything. But there are so many ways to get involved with these people that if you ask the right questions, you can get really good answers and then you co-develop something that you know is going to have a less or lower risk and higher probability of working effectively through a lot of adverse environments. You know, like as an example, you heat up magnets, that's not good either. So you don't want to go through autoclaving too many times because you'll actually degrade some of the forces. But anyhow, all of that leads to this. You know, you finally have a design, you put it together, you made, I think, uh, 25 of them. It was made in, well, the first ones, to be fair, were machined because that's a cheap way to do it. Um, we have sources around the world where we get this done, sometimes locally, but if it's less expensive, we have re re resources in India, China, um, Korea, and we'll get the first ones machined. A lot of our prototypes are machined because they look real and they act real when they're done compared to trying to print them. Now we did print a couple of them, but they are structurally not appropriate. So after that was done, we got into low cost tooling. And there's a couple approaches to that. One can be, you know, just using a aluminum. Um, but if you're trying to hold real high tolerances, that's not an ideal situation. Another one is to use a, I'm gonna call it a low cost, highly machinable steel. It's not something that will last forever. 
but it is something that you can get into production very, very quickly. And if you're working with a good company, they'll actually maintain it through the life of your product as long as you place orders, which means that when certain areas wear, and they will, they will patch them, they will fix them, or they'll remake it. And that's a good thing to have as a supplier, to have that type of relationship. We do. And I have to say, a lot of our tools have started out this way, and they've lasted for years, which isn't a bad thing. But you can see there's kind of intricate. Um, the draw ratio is on it. There's pretty minimal uh, relief on them, and uh, they work ra rather well. So as we're doing all this, we can keep moving from design for manufacturing. Next slide, Margie. That's it. That's the last. Okay. All right. Well, then I'll add one or two more things. While all of this is going on, you're doing the quality work. All right. A lot of times we'll work with the customer's vendors, but if they don't have anybody or they just have an advisor that comes into review, which is more typical, we work with them to find out the specifications of what they think are required. We add other comments and we turn on our team. So as everything is going on, all the drawings, all the documentation, everything is compiled and appropriate so that if we make revisions in the future, first off, we're not allowed to make them. We have to work with our customer, ask for approval to do it, but they usually have a seat of green light guru and everything is coupled together. Whatever we do is put in there, whatever they do is put in there. If we wanna make a change, we have to put in a change request for the engineering department. That's what you would do in a real company. You know, ask for a change, marketing gets involved, everything else, you know, occurs and they go, yes, go ahead and do this. But our goal again, is that we wanna make something that is fast to market. I mean, it is nice as it is to be able to really test everything to 200 degrees. Um, we have to have 99% of it in place very, very quickly so that you can get to market and you can find out if this product is exactly what you need. I can tell you that 60% of our customers pivot, something changes and that's okay. If we know what those changes are, a lot of times in the molds themselves, we can add features that could be changed out. If we don't, we again, we just try to get it done quickly. So I'll be quiet because I can talk for a long time, sorry. No, thank you, Kevin. That's It's fascinating to listen to you talk about this and it's fascinating to consider the wide variety of industries that you work in and all the experts that you pull together. Um, I'm gonna go off script just a little bit. Um, I, I know you might have to pop off at any any moment and I, I really do appreciate that you've taken the time to, to be here and talk to us. So you talked a little bit about um, form fit and function and how you ensure the de design meets user needs. I, I loved that you brought doctors in there um, the people that are actually going to use the the product. Um, we we talk to uh, clients a lot about uh, the necessity of doing deep customer discovery even before they get to you. I know that you you talked about doing some of that once you have a design. Um, but can you talk a little bit about that? Just a little bit about what kind of homework companies need to be doing on their customer base. Absolutely. You know, it, this is one of those games where a lot of people will come in, they have a wonderful idea, but they have not really, really talked to their customers yet. And I, to be honest with you, I have been at fault here also and came up with a product that was faster, better, cheaper. That's not what the customers cared about. It was not their goal. And it's sometimes not easy because you go out there with your presentation, you have your energy and your enthusiasm and you're out there and you're telling them all the things that are wonderful about it and you don't know until much later that you really miss the target for what the customer was looking for and that just takes a little bit more time a little bit more openness it's not easy for an inventor to be open sometimes to listen to the things that unfortunately will make a better product for him it may not be as exciting may even be some features that somebody says are not necessary for now and you have to listen and if you do then you get a better idea the more people you do this with of will it be accepted and do i have a market if you don't do it you have an uphill sale you now have to convince everything why all your ideas are the best in the world and that can be a challenge and again if you include these people as part of your advisory team you know, that's one of the big things I look for when people come in. Who's on your advisory team? How have you tested this? Who have you talked to? 
And these are people that are the ones that are going to use it, that understand its application. They may agree or disagree on how you're approaching it, but they can certainly offer advice. And the more of that you get, each step mitigates more risk. So if you can do that, that's wonderful. If you love to play with clay and come up with a design, if it's a physical device, that's great. If it is more just a liquid biomedical devices, we're working on ones for antibodies for, oh my God, for different cellular express proteins. I'll leave it at that. And again, people are coming up with wonderful ideas of a new vaccine that they want, but the approach that they're taking is just, well, redundant in some cases and in other ones, it's not going to go after the antigen that they're looking for or the site that they're looking for or response. And that's, that's tricky. That takes a team of experts to help analyze the protein. So does that help? Does that make sense? It does. It does. Um, it, it brings up another question though. That's just a <laughs> curiosity. And again, I'm completely off script because I find all of this fascinating. So I can't help sure. myself. <laughs> How many products have you touched? Harbor Designs. Oh my God. Um, yeah. <laughs> hundreds. I mean, to be fair, I've been doing this, you know, in for got 50 plus years. Um, well, 50 years. And we started off by doing things for um, hollow fiber bioreactors and such, you know, ways of growing uh, cells. And that's how we started Harbor up. But previous to that, we were doing radiation chambers, DNA sequencers, uh, protein purification systems. But at the same time, we were doing automotive parts and other things, which actually gave us some patents because of the way things were being done in the automotive market, we were able to look at safety systems that they were using and bring it into some of the medical products as, uh, uh, can I say, ways of making sure people don't put their fingers in where they don't belong. Um, and a lot of the electrical things that were going on, same thing, a lot of the automotive stuff is pretty high voltage and we were carrying it into things when you design something that is putting out a you know, 1.2 tor Tesla uh, magnetic field, it's it's got a hell of a kick and you better make sure that it's uh, well insulated. And a lot of that tech came out of the automotive market too. So um, am I answering your question or am I? You are, no, you are. I wanted to, uh, people to get a flavor for the, um, the vast number of industries that, you know, design and manufacturing firms touch and also to understand, you know, a, a, a little bit deeper your background and why um, you know, why what you're saying is credible. I mean, I know it's credible. I think a lot of people listening know it's credible, but that just helps people to understand, look, design and manufacturing firms do this stuff all the time. They do it with a variety of industries um, and you can bring any product to them and, and feel comfortable that they'll pull in the right team of experts if they don't already have the expertise in, in house. So with all of that, um, with all of other people's IP that you, we, you mentioned intellectual property, you talked about patents, um, you're touching very sensitive things yes. of people and, and people are very, you know, entrepreneurs are very, very protective of their stuff. They should um, be. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you guys can talk about your process for protecting other people's IP, that would be great. No problem. We usually start off immediately with, you know, do you have a patent in place? If you do, you've got some good protection. If you do not, and this is early stage, then you get an NDA with anybody that you are talking to. So that's a non-disclosure agreement. Some are highly egregious on uh, what you're first born. Um, and other ones are more practical. You know, they want to look for any place between three and five years of making sure their information is maintained but they all have clauses that look, if we part relationships, this needs to be destroyed. It needs to be returned, you know, disposed of. And we follow that. Again, we're in a company that if we ever release somebody's technology, we would probably go out of business very quickly because that word would spread. But we wanna make sure that all of our individuals within the company understand that. So they have to go through training. So our employees know, no, you don't get to show this stuff to your buddies and you can't, just go out to a company that does have some expertise and ask too many leading questions, you get an NDA in place. Then what we did is we hired um, a PhD in quality systems that Margie talked about. Um, we take the Raytheon approach, and that's what she was inferring. Raytheon designs things, but they don't make them usually. They, they tend to send them out. The way they do that is they hire a guy like this guy 
who goes out to their facility, make sure that they can do it, make sure they have the proper NDAs in place, that they know that they're working for a government organization and they will be put out of business if anything gets released. And what we did is we hired him. So he works for our company now and we send him around the world. So he goes to China and India and across the United States and into Canada. And we validate vendors and make sure that they understand this is highly secure information. Now, we also divide things up. Um, we do work with some countries that tend to borrow things from time to time. And what we do is we give them the things that it's OK to borrow, like an enclosure. So a lot of our injection molded product is, in fact, being done in China and done very well. Um, but we don't tend to send the electronics over there and we do not send the software over there. Uh, that is kept and maintained here in the States with companies that we work with. Now, if it gets into a commercial product that's really, really high volume, I'm sorry, you don't have any choice. It's going to go international, um, but it's getting closer. You know, as they are starting to have delays, uh, I'm going to say reinitialization problems, shipping issues, all sorts of tariffs that change daily, it seems like. Um, then, yes, you can bring things more back into the States. And I can tell you, almost, I'm going to say 100% of our customers will say, I want it made in the States. And that's great. And we do start that way. Most of our vendors are local. If we can, if we can get it made in Maryland, we'll do it. Um, but then, unfortunately, when it becomes something that is mildly competitive with something in the market, and you're up to a million units, and here in the States, it costs $15 to make, and in China, it costs two, people tend to change their mind. So that happens. We have a backup for all of that. Usually when we quote something, we quote it in the US and international. Uh, we work with our vendors that are already pre-qualified and under NDAs. We've worked with them for years, so we trust them um, as much as you can. And that has worked rather well for us. We have not seen any copies of any of the products, even things like golf putting aids, be copied yet. So, but they, you know, they can. Once they're commercially available, you know, anybody can buy one and reverse engineer. Yeah, and I think that's um, a key point. Thanks, Kevin, for covering that so well. Um, we want to create jobs and keep things local in Maryland. And one of the things that Harbor Designs is doing, um, along with, I think, forward thinking engineering firms like RPM Tech with Cyrus, um, looking to help manufacture and develop and assemble those products in Maryland. We would like to, with the Department of Commerce, uh, BDC, TEDCO, um, University of Maryland Momentum Fund, keep as many of the products and projects that we possibly can here. So um, Cyrus with RPM Tech uh, has been very, very good at identifying, I don't want my, pro my clients going to another state to create their physical products. I've gotten it to a point where it's designed for manufacturing and we're thrilled to be able to talk to companies like that to help their clients to keep that business here in Maryland at a very quality uh, process and development. And you'd asked a question about my background. I mean, I started off with a company that's now Lonza. I was in the R&D department developing uh, immunodiagnostics for uh, rubella CMV, toxoherpes, you know, just antigen and antibody detection systems. And back in those days, because this is ancient history, uh, a lot of the tools didn't exist. So we had to design and develop them with optics companies to do colorimetric reading and things like that, software. And it, it was my job to integrate all that together and then bring it through pilot operations, which meant making sure that things could be done under a GMP guideline to fill and reproducibly make a product to put in five, 10 Ks for those products and comparing things that were pretty weirdly diverse um, and then get it into full level production, which required, you know, storage, logistics, long-term studies, all those kind of things. Uh, did that, uh, developed a couple different products for lymphocyte transformation and went to a company that uh, I worked with that was a plastics company. They were, just barely doing anything like this, but they wanted to get into it. So I came to them and turned them into a multi-million dollar company making things for life technologies, which at the time was getting into all sorts of, uh, could I say DNA analysis. They were making all sorts of uh, devices to break DNA in certain sections, which got into DNA sequencing, which got into the FBI and making equipment for them. Um, and then finally into another company where we got into larger devices that were uh, radiation stations and uh, uh, other other things that are around bioreactors and such. So essentially a wide, uh, wide and varied background. 
yeah. um, which which makes sense for for someone that's in um, design and manufacturing. Um, one of the things I wanted to do, and I know we're, uh, we, we scheduled the meetup for an hour and a half so that we had time for questions, but I want to try to contain as much as we can into an hour and we're, we're coming up on that time. Um, I want to talk a little bit and Margie and I discussed this yesterday uh, as, as we were preparing for this and I was looking at co-op text device and, and thinking about, um, you know, how you built that. But then on the other end, uh, you, you did work with customers, but they, they have to get it into the market. So packaging is something at some point that companies need to talk about. And I just want to talk about that a little bit. We did have a couple requests that we do a session on marketing and packaging and branding, um, all part of marketing. But can you and or Margie, one of the two of you talk about um, how you talk a company through packaging and what you what design firms do for them? Yeah, we do. Uh, we, we do packaging that is, I'll call it Apple-esque. You know, if you want a package that looks really, really pretty and is presenting your product in a certain way, which is one of the things that Sonovi did that had a unique stethoscope. They wanted to package it and the package actually looks better than an Apple package, in my opinion. But we helped them develop it. Um, but other ones just need, I'm going to call it basic protective packaging. And it's because they're shipping it around the world. Some of the bioreactors we make are in a brown cardboard box you know, because they didn't want to have a lot of uh, excess cost associated with, you know, finishing it. And uh, I'm going to say, well, urethane cutout end caps that have to go through typical drop tests to make sure that when they get thrown onto the airplane from 12 feet away, they will survive. Um, we do that testing with our vendors, and we have four of them that we work with here in the States and two internationally. Some of the packaging is very, very simple. Also, if it is going to be for, let's say, a putting aid, it might have a little formed tray, okay? But inside of a box that when it is on a shelf in a store stands out. So it is multicolor, graphically grabbing, you know, it's a different type of packaging. And then we've done blister packaging and things like that. It's different packaging for different markets and different protection. Is that, is that fair? I can't hear anything. That's because I'm following my own guidelines and muting my mic. I'm forgetting on the other end that unmuting is also an important part of that process. Um, no, that is important. I think that's that's good information. Uh, and it's something that a lot of companies don't think about. Um, and Margie and I were talking yesterday about the timing of that. How do you know when it's time to start working on packaging? And I assume that's when you've got it. Prototype. You have to have something physical to play with. Most packaging companies, though they do work with CAD, are slightly less sophisticated. They want to touch something and make sure it holds correctly. So they like to have something that they can work with. And they're going to ask you questions of how you're going to store it too. Since we're a logistics group, we manufacture and we put things on shelves. Some of them have to be put at certain temperatures. Other ones have to be literally at refrigerated temperatures. And some of them just can be in a warehouse you need to understand that so that they can pick the material or work with you to get the material selected correctly. Mm. Thank you. I'm going to ask, I'm going to open it up now. If anyone has a question, just unmute your mic. Um, that's, that's a little bit of a free for all. There have been, you know, a 20 of us or so uh, off and on uh, throughout the event. So if, if you have questions, uh, feel free to unmute and ask. And in the meantime, I want to talk about, I know, um, manufacturers like like you, Harbor Designs, and also RPM Tech. I know Cyrus is on today. Um, I know you you're all working very hard in response to COVID ID, uh, COVID nineteen. I don't know why I said that. Um, I I appreciate that. I'm sure everyone on the call appreciates that and the amount of time and effort you're putting into this. Um, the state has some uh, programs that. Uh, Margie, we talked about yesterday. Do you want to just give us an update on some of the things that are going on? Sure, um, be happy to. So as everyone from a business point of view knows, there are state um, and federal funded programs that help get your business through this. There are also a number of call to action proposals that the Department of Commerce and Economic Development is working on. Uh, for manufacturing, WeWorks is providing a 50K grant for companies that are looking to pivot or develop new products in response to critical essential items 
to respond to COVID. Um, many of us know that Trump put into the Production Act, which actually is taking companies who produce a similar or type other type of product and asking them to produce the items from the essential list, which I learned yesterday is actually going to diminish the state's responsiveness because now they're starting to get large bulk items from Hanes, 3M, Under Armour, things like that. But that doesn't mitigate or change the need that we have within the state. Um, there's also the disaster recovery manufacturing um, loan that is up to $100,000, which companies, I know a lot of companies have applied for and um, the economic groups are looking through those proposals this week in order to develop um, and identify who those are going to. Um, I've been fortunate to have talked with um, Department of Commerce as well as a couple of other groups at the state level, and they are fast tracking a number of product development or products that have been in development today through the process in order to get the supplies on the back end. But this also means that they are looking for companies who are currently producing large scale thousands of these items. So whether they are um, clear masks or cut and sewn masks, ventilators, splitter kits, gowns, socks, booties, sanitizers, um, they are doing, the state is doing everything feasible and possible along with all the other entities like TEDCO, the Momentum Fund are trying to move and fast track through SBIR grants, um, NIH grants, um, and folks like Chuck Montague and our TEDCO folks on the phone are also fielding a lot of calls from people, encouraging them to put in their information, which has oftentimes been reduced at this um, critical time. So I appreciate all the work that everybody is doing around the state, working long hours and weekends in order to process through all of the people working on essential pro products for the COVID-19 um, initiative. And that's really what it's all focused on is how can you produce these items for the state of Maryland and then beyond? But the needs are here in our state first, and that's where we're really focusing on a variety of different um, funds. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I just want to make sure everyone knows that um, the, the Department of Commerce, the state of Maryland has set up a website for businesses to go to for information, and it is govstatus.egov.com backslash MD dash coronavirus dash business. So that's someplace if your business is, is struggling, if you're having some issues, there's uh, there are resources there. Um, yes, and on the Maryland made um, RMI website, they're also asking people to sign up in that directory and I'll post it on our link right now. So if you're currently manufacturing, developing any products on that list and it's you will look at Harbor Designs and it says equipment, including ventilators. At this moment, we are not producing ventilators, so it says that we're not. Um, it, there's nothing in that equipment because they really are looking for a particular product, um, which is the ventilator. So I will post that as well. Okay, thank you. Um, I think I'm, okay. I thought I was talking again without muting my mic. A couple people asked that I put the link for um, business support or business resources in the chat window, so I just did that. Um, I haven't gotten any other questions uh, other than for the links. Uh, so I think we can wrap up our conversation. Um, yeah, I do, I do know real quick, Kim, we do have Chuck Montague on the line as well as some TEDCO representatives. If yeah. they have anything else they want to share, because I know it kind of blasted through them, but yeah. they are the ones who are the experts in those areas if they have any additional information. Okay. Sure. Uh, Chuck Montague, do you have anything else you want to share? No, thanks. Thanks for the calling me out, Margie. Um, <laughs> no, no, there there is a lot of activity going on now, um, and there's a lot of resources. Uh, so reach out to many of these folks, uh, me, Ted Co, as Margie said, you know, uh, DevTech, we're all here to support this and help uh, things move forward. There are a lot of ideas out there, and so many of the ideas that Margie put forward, I will tell you, filtering them out before they go forward is really important. Because um, <laughs> there's lots of quality ideas, and we are happy to not only help move the good ideas forward, but on the other ideas, we're, we're uh, good about telling you what you need to do to refine them. Um, about, uh, as was mentioned, uh, 
about uh, uh, pivoting and trying yeah. to figure that out. So, yeah. so yep, there's resources out here and uh, use all of us, so. Thank you, Chuck. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna ask our other Chuck, uh, Chuck Ernst, if you want to uh, g come on and talk about some of the things that Tedco is doing. Nothing like putting you on the spot. Uh, Kim, I uh, I'm not aware of anything in particular other than uh, trying to make people aware of. Uh, online sources of information through TEDCO. Uh, Jack probably has a better response than I do, but uh, uh, certainly TEDCO has tried to move all of its meetings to either webinars or uh, other uh, Zoom or uh, some other way of communicating something online. Yeah. And, so businesses. Yeah, and we have multiple, multiple messages on and uh, information at the website on resources for manufacturers and tech companies. Okay, thank you. Um, Jack, do you have anything to add to that? Anything else you're aware of? I'd have to say that Margie did an excellent job of covering the, the multitude of ways that um, Tedco is trying to be supportive of the ecosystem and, and just being a source for connections. Um, I mean, that's that's really the role that we're, we're, we're fulfilling in this. When you've got a Harvard Designs and an RPM tech, you know, that are there on the front lines engaging with the innovators and the producers to make some of these things happen to fight this virus. Um, you know, so uh, Margie, great job. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're here for you. Anything we, we can do, just let us know. Thank you, Jack. Thanks, Jack. Um, we did have another question pop up in the um, chat window. Ashok, do you want to ask that question? Sure. Thank you, Kim. Um, I wanted to ask if anyone knows if uh, the state of Maryland will uh, support any uh, one who wants to manufacture the PPB, PPE equipment in Maryland with some order guarantees because, uh, as we all know, uh, these things are much, much cheaper to manufacture outside the U.S., but if you manufacture in Maryland, the cost per unit will be higher. So for somebody to go ahead and set up a manufacturing shop here, there needs to be some order guarantees from the state to be able to sustain long term. Okay, so I'm, I'm just going to give that a second because I know we have a couple of state representatives on with us today and I appreciate that. Um, in the meantime, before we answer that, I just want to make really clear uh, to, to those of you who maybe aren't currently working in the medical supply chain, um, if you don't have experience in this, it's probably not necessarily the best time to jump in. Um, or to change all of your business processes so that you can do this because you will end up with challenges on the other end. So these are, again, we talked a lot today about thinking through this entire huge process for product development and getting your product to market. Um, you don't wanna jump into something that you don't have a full, a really good view of and a good understanding of. Um, so do we have someone that can answer Ashok's question on uh, whether or not the state is able to guarantee um, X number of purchases uh, in advance of someone trying to uh, develop uh, uh, medical supplies and equipment in response to COVID-19. Tamara, I see you've um, un unmuted. I'm not aware of that uh, specifically because I'm not sure that the question certainly hasn't been presented at my level, uh, but there is, uh, there are, um, first of all, the state uh, has a, uh, you know, a, grant for manufacturers, it's a $100,000 grant available for manufacturers that want to, uh, uh, you know, need to purchase equipment or do other things to refit uh, in order to make this production. And that grant is still, um, still available. Uh, the other, you know, but the, to the main question, I, I can't really answer that because that's being handled by procurement, but I'm happy to, um, I can't give you the email off the top of my head. There's just so many emails for so many different aspects of, of these issues. 
but um, I'm going to dig for it here, and then uh, maybe you can send it out later, Kim. I started talking without unmuting again. Yes. Um, thank you, Tamar. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. I think we have some, <laughs> some great conversations going on in the chat window, but no specific questions. Go ahead, Margie. Yeah, I do know that working through um, a government prime uh, with Harbor Designs and the distributors on some of the products that we make, um, they are constantly at the federal and state level being um, asked to confirm the quantity, when it can be developed, where it's being developed. So they are doing everything from a, um, a procurement standpoint to make sure that the supplies can be um, delivered. And most of the time, if, if you don't have in your position that particular supply or the numbers that they're looking for, we've gotten a, a don't bother with supplying it at the at the federal and state level. So that might mean if you're not in production, it might be harder to to get there. Okay, thank you. Um, I don't want to wrap up too quickly. Um, we have some conversation going on in the chat window, which is wonderful. Um, I, I don't see any more issues that we need to discuss on this meetup. Um, I will say though, in, in kind of wrapping up again, how much I truly appreciate the, the time that you've spent with us, Harbor Designs, because this is um, critical information for businesses. And I know that, that you guys and, and people like Cyrus and RPM Tech are just working nonstop to try to be responsive. And we, as a community, thank you for doing that. You're one of the people on the front lines, as they say, that probably aren't getting the respect that we like. Um, your grocery store workers, please tell them thank you when you go into the store, when you get gas, please say thank you, or at least wave at the window. Um, they're getting stressed out as well as our, our hospital workers. And I know this because two of them are my children. Um, Tamar, did you have another, um, something else you wanted to bring up? Yeah, the um, I know that the RFI process has closed at the moment, but I think it's a fluid thing. And I put an email for Dr. Chinona on there. He is, um, Ernesto is the um, acting director of our biohealth unit, and he's been seconded to MEMA to help uh, with the procurement, the technical issues around procurement for uh, this process. And uh, the questioner can can email him. Okay, that's fantastic. Everyone should have access to the chat. Um, yes, and, and I do thank everybody that has been on the call today. We uh, do these to, to try to provide information to businesses as an opportunity for all of us to stay connected uh, when it's challenging to remain connected. Um, so thank you, Jack, Chuck, thank you, Chuck Ernst, thank you, Chuck Montague, uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, thank you, Tamar. Thank you, everybody who has been able to be um, to join us this morning. Um, we will be doing these uh, approximately every two weeks. Right now, it looks like we're going to uh, we're going to talk about marketing. So we talked a little bit about um, how a manufacturing firm can help you with packaging uh, your product. Part of that is branding. You need to think through all of this. Um, so we're going to talk to a marketing firm. We've had a couple questions in our um, our meetup group about that. So that is what we will follow up with. If there is nothing else, I see a few uh, chats coming in. Uh, everyone saying thank you to us. No, thank you to you. If this was great, it's because of everybody that's um, that participated this morning. Um, so with that, I will say wear your masks, wash your hands, uh, stay safe and stay inside if you can, or at least out in your backyard or something. Um, and we will see you in two weeks. So thank you for joining us.